Welcome back to Flow State with Tyler Inch on the Flock. Guys, in this episode, we go over many topics like me recapping my lacrosse season. We discuss our relationships with our significant others while they're away. We also talk about recapturing lightning in a bottle and how that affects us. And then finally, we go over reframing our mindset to a better life. Guys, if you like this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. And make sure you enjoy podcast number 15 of the Flow State. Flow State, I can't wait to see straight. I can't wait to change fate. I can't wait to flee hate. Keeping all my good traits. Letting all the mistakes go. I beat the boat. I take control. Spread good vibes is all I'm told. Never sold this always more. I can grow and I'll explore. All the past that I can map out in my head is like a tour. Know the world is evil. People strip you right down to the core. But you know that you can be way better than you were before. For your mother, for your father, for your sister, or your toddler, you can be the one that makes them feel the best when they're around you. So don't be a lazy coward. Just listen for an hour. Sean and Tyler about to show you just how you can hold the power. It's a little bit of some muscle, huh? That's good. That's good. What's up? Where are you right now? I'm not in the closet. In the closet. Definitely not in the closet. <laughs> you got a dresser there. Yeah. Uh, moved the dresser over there, threw out the carpet, uh, threw out, what else did we throw out? I threw out a desk. And then That's moved the dresser over there. That's nice. Yeah. Everything's getting settled in. Got the TV up. Oh my goodness! Look at that thing. Mm-hmm. What does it got? Like ninety-nine channels. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, you got that nice light switch on the wall. So yellow. <laughs> What's up, dude? Nothing much. What's going on? Not much. Just uh, having a day. <laughs> having a day. Are you fasted today? Uh, I didn't. Well, so my fasting, I think I've been doing it, what, since like last Monday or something like that. So it was like just about 10, 11 days in. I think I probably dropped like 1% or 2% body fat. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure of my body weight right now, but I definitely feel leaner. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it's just a combination of my new schedule or, you know, just being out of schedule, but, uh, I'm consistently tired. Oh, wow. Um, I'm sleeping fairly well, but I basically, I'm not having dinner and I'm having more, a little bit more food for breakfast and lunch. Um, but I'm probably going to eat more today and see if that helps my, uh, tiredness. Mm. So we'll see. So have you eaten yet today? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, this morning I, I woke up. Um, like usually my fast is actually like no food like after four. Okay. Got it. So I've been doing that. And uh, again, just basically not having dinner. So I'll have lunch, you know, and then that's it until the next day. Wow. But uh, I am going to start doing some blood, you know, some interstitial glucose uh, tracking when Lauren gets back as she um, has some abilities to do that um, with her work. So, Oh, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to track some of that and see what happens with my blood sugar and maybe that's a factor in here and maybe it's the foods I'm eating, what I'm doing, my feeding. Yeah. So Did, did uh, lacrosse finish out? Yep. Lacrosse finished up. When was that? Uh, we had our game on Friday last week and that was it. Mm. Any W's for the season? Zero W's. Oh no, the O for. Very consistent. I told them the last time I saw a team go O for the century was Evan's team, our brother Evan, um, whose team was, um, that was the year before I came to high school. They went like 0-11. Yeah. I had a season on Maroons. We went 0-6. How's that feel? Did not feel good. Did not feel good. Yeah. But, I mean, the test for me was to really stick to my guns in terms of, like, what my purpose in coaching was. Mm. And uh, it's not to win. 
Uh, that's not the primary goal is to, you know, improve skills, um, you know, make them better men uh, and, and work on that. And the last week of the season, that's kind of what I did and let go of all the uh, attachments to winning and just kind of coached. And we played so much better. Like it was a night and day team. And if we played more consistent like that throughout the season, uh, you know, we would have won a few games, but you know, I can't, uh, you know, the lesson was found in me trying it another way and trying to force that square pick into a round hole for two and a half months. And then finally surrendering to the idea that like these kids aren't going to be yelled into doing it right. Right. So what, what, would uh, unlock the flow for you in connecting with them? Uh, you know, obviously doing some meditation, uh, talking to them, talking to my girlfriend, um, and, uh, just taking some time, even talking with you a little bit and, you know, uh, just kind of embracing and seeing what those beliefs were and then, um, you know, going a different way. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, even though you didn't come down with a W, they all improved, they're better for it because th- would one or two wins really changed or move the needle that no, much? No, you're right. right. Exactly. So yeah, even though the O for is never a good feeling, it's a f- great opportunity to learn and grow. <laughs> yeah. So just think like four years after the, that Fox Lane team went O and 11, they were basically, sta- you know, competing for a state title, mm-hmm. you know, so you have to, there's, there's ebbs and flows, there's highs and lows, um, and you never know what that might mean. It might end your program or it might be a catalyst for people to actually be like, you know what, there's no expectation anymore. Let's just go out there and see what this is all about. Yeah. You know, how is it, how is it being solo for the past? Cause Lauren doesn't get back till tomorrow, right? Yeah. She gets back late tonight. Uh, we've been in touch a good amount. Obviously it's a little more lonely without having her here. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the, uh, the company and I enjoy like the physicality of being able to like hug somebody and, and be with somebody. So, um, you know, obviously that's not here right now, but, um, obviously it's an opportunity for me to, you know, be with myself. And that's kind of the way I took it when, uh, she had, uh, left. Yeah. Oh, any, uh, changes in perception, any insight, or has it just been like, yeah, no, it was good. We, we've had some good conversations about some stuff and, and in terms of like where we are in a relationship and, and, you know, our, you know, love for each other and our attraction to each other. So, um, it's definitely grown since we've been apart instead of just like a fading or a, uh, you know, uh, distance, you know, creating more of like a either resentment or not feeling like this relationship is right. It's more of like, we're more close almost. Yeah build that perspective to be appreciate the time you have together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we, we do a fairly good job of that as is, but, uh, you know, when, when she does come back tonight, you know, we have some things planned, um, this weekend and, um, you know, we have some trips planned ahead and she's going to be doing a little traveling as well. So we're going to have to kind of figure that out, but you know, it's a, uh, you know, we've been dating for about six months now and it's a opportunity to see how we react when we are apart from each other. And, you know, be honest with each other and work through the things that we need to work on, that kind of thing. Mm, yeah. When I was away at training camp for the soul, which was only a week, but my goal was actually to not have any communication during that time and just allow myself to go through that process. And it came, I came out of it with a much deeper, a deeper love and a deeper appreciation and an excitement for their relationship in a way. Yeah. Do you feel that's like a little bit uncomfortable to, to discuss this? Yeah, there's definitely a level of discomfort in the, in discussing it, but Hey, that's even more reason to dive into it. Um, I think part of it is a judge an inner judge to be like, Hey, you shouldn't discuss this or this is your own private thing. And, uh, <clears throat> there, I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is just haven't talked about it before. Yeah. So there's this unease of not talking about it before. And this is the first time I've explored it. So there's that part of it going on inside of me. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's coming up. Definitely. 
I feel that as well. It's like almost like, you know, saying those words are just uncomfortable, but the more you kind of, um, re not repeat, but practice it, the easier it becomes. Exactly. It's just being, practicing being open and vulnerable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, you feel like you're about to be attacked. Exactly. But it's open and vulnerable. There's so much power. Like that's been a mantra of mine. Power. I, I am open and vulnerable and power and vulnerability. Um, because vulnerability builds connection. Once you open yourself up and make yourself vulnerable, then people feel that they can do the same. And then that's when you build stronger, deeper connections with people. And that's ultimately what I want in this life is to build strong connections with people and love and peace. And um, if I can't practice vulnerability and being open myself, then how can I expect that from others? Yeah, it's a very good point. Hmm. So, yeah. But um, I've been diving in like the... It's funny, like the podcast I had sent over to you with the guy, the guy, guy, his name's guy, guy for a minute and his brother, oh God, Elon. Man. It's funny, they're brothers and they're in the personal development space and just they're, they're I've been diving into their podcast for about two weeks now and I, I don't know if it's being tied to with moving because when you move, you definitely have a different perspective on everything and you feel like this change in your life. But since diving into their podcast and then making this move, I just feel uh, an abundance of change and perspective and a lot more self-awareness and, um, just an excitement to grow and adapt. And, um, I just started this book too. It's called the big leap. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? I think I might've seen the cover before. It's this cover. My the God, big leap. That, that goldfish, the gold, it's a goldfish jumping out of a bowl into a bigger bowl. Um, anyway, the uh, premise of the book is that we have this upper limit problem. So when things are going well, we find ways to fuck it up and, uh, it's like this thermostat. So, uh, if you're in madly in love, then you'll find something financially to fuck it up. Or if like things are going great with your finances or with your work, then you'll stress about something. So it's uncovering, uh, first bringing awareness to the problem itself and then figuring out the limiting beliefs that are tied to it. So um, I'm just digging in. I'm only a quarter of the way, like 50 pages in, and it's like a 200-page book. But just that premise alone I thought was um, a really a wonderful way of of framing this, this, I don't know, problem or the human condition in a way um, and shedding light on it. And his theory is that you can almost – you don't have to be a victim to this problem. You can shed light on it, overcome it, and actually choose to be and allow yourself to enjoy the abundance and happiness that you come through rather than falling victim to self-sabotage. Yep. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing how easy it is for the ego to create these sabotage situations, whereas you think that they're actual reality and you're actually constructing those situations. So for me personally, uh, you know, my need to attach myself to like a guru and to attach myself to something that's solid and someone who knows the answers. And basically if I copy that person, then I'll be able to be happy or find fulfillment. And I'm constantly reminded over and over again that no one is, no one has all the answers. And I, uh, I am, you know, I catch myself falling into those traps, you know, consistently through my life. And, you know, it happened recently with me and we, my, myself and my, my girlfriend kind of talked it over a little bit and I was kind of like shaken and had a couple of rough days of just like, fuck, like what the hell is my life all about? And it kind of feels like you go to back to square one. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm learning that that's just old habits of, of kind of going there. And once you kind of identify it as an old habit, you can realize that's that's not true. You don't have to follow that pattern. You can do it your own way, and uh, you know there's also freedom in that that you you can create your own way, and that there's no answer. That there is no right or wrong answer. It's just going about your life the best way you can. And for me, that's super uncomfortable because I want to find the right way to do it. Because if there's a wrong way, that means I'm unworthy. That's not I'm not accepted. Um, you know, just based upon programming. So this recent kind of shift for me is one in which. I am uh, kind of split open and kind of just feeling the uh, yeah, just feeling right now. Yeah, as you're saying that, what was kept on popping into my 
mind and what I felt was just this idea that we can change and this idea that we can become different people and what we've done in our past or what we've experienced in our past, we can, the, if we can let go of it and learn that we can actually grow and, and change and become different people then, and that's possible. Like you don't have to be a victim to who you were. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another gray day in New York. I'm just looking outside. Look at this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Are you sure you're not in Seattle? I know. Uh, though the temperature has gone up, so that's been nice. So it's not freezing, but it's just, I just want sunny weather. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just noticed that. <laughs> What's this t-shirt you have on? So this t-shirt is from, uh, the competition that we put on about six years ago called mm-hmm. the hunger, F- hunger for more games. It was a team CrossFit competition. You don't say. Yeah, it was, a. Uh, it was actually a lot of fun throwing those events. Uh, Bring something to mind of like, um, have you ever done something like that and then try to repeat it and then it goes like shit? Well, so we did two of them and this was actually the second one yeah. and it actually went, I think, just as good if not better than the first because the nice. first one was a solo competition and then this one was a team competition. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't and- done the same way then. Right. You weren't um, trying to recapture lightning in a bottle. Exactly. So, the, I don't know. When it comes down to CrossFit, I always feel that team competitions, even though they might not be as fun to watch, they're better for whoever's for running it. Better yeah, and for the better for the, just so many people. It, right, yeah. Everyone, so many people, so you can, you can smush teams together and everyone can get through it quicker. Um, the workouts are more fun because you're working with other people, so you have that team dynamic of the sport. Um, and it just can go smoother. So I, I, we did, uh, for the past, since I've been at my CrossFit gym now we've done four times, uh, so the first three times we did as an individual event. And then the last time we did as a team event and we did it and we're like, never again, are we going to do solo? It will (laughs) always be team because the solo event, you would start at nine o'clock and you get out like two, like what the fuck? This one, it was like 9 o'clock start. We got out at like 11.30. <laughs> oh, wow. And probably put and the same it, amount of people through. Put the same amount of people through. People had a better time. Uh, the events were great. It was just a, such a better experience. So we were just like, all right, team all the way. In your experience right now, like, what do you think uh, the, the power of CrossFit is right now? Like, Do you think it's still on an incline? Do you think it's steadied off? Do you think it's on a decline? in terms of its ability to get people in the door, uh, what is the, let's just, yeah, let's just start there. Um, I, I think it's a decline. I, it's just so ubiquitous. It just doesn't have that. Uh, it ha- I feel like it had its moment in 2000, like 14, 2013. And since then it just hasn't had that same cachet. I still think there's um, – when people come in and try it and do it, they do still get really into it and can get hooked by it. But the level of it just being this this new thing that everyone's doing and that buzz around it, I feel like that buzz is gone. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, you know, if I had my way, I, I definitely would um... – explore other all the alternatives in terms of group training but i definitely think that there is still a market for group training Mm -hmm. um it's just making it a little bit more versatile not not uh you know having being pigeon held necessarily just by crossfit yeah Um, i don't think that people are just running around looking for crossfit anymore i don't think the marketing is there now as as uh the crossfit as a brand i don't think i think that it was you know they they got down the rabbit hole of talking about 
you know, the CrossFit games and those things got too interwoven. So right yeah. now I think most people are kind of looking at that as like, oh yeah, that's the thing I see on ESPN. Like, no, 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 it's a fitness methodology. So, um, you know, again, there's nothing good or bad about it. It's just a matter of how we move forward from here. Is, is there going to be some one or some people that step up and say, okay, this is the rebranding of CrossFit. This is what it's about. And they push for that. Are they going to come out with something new, some kind of new fitness methodology that um, encompasses full, full fitness, but also involves, um, you know, a lot of other aspects of fitness in, in general? Um, you know, the, we don't know. Yeah. Um, have you looked at the way that OPEX has kind of gone about doing their uh, classes or group training? No. I listened to a podcast. Uh, Barbell Shrugs had uh, James Fitzgerald's on, and he went into it. And this idea of everyone, you know, just kind of like ID programming, but everyone goes into the gym and does it at their own. So you still have that element of working together with people, but everyone's kind of doing their own thing. And the coach just floats around and helps people out here and there. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously there's some places down here like, um, um, Crested performance is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's some other facilities that are similar to that, whether they work Crested employees or you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, there definitely is a market for that. However, there has to be some basic competency of those individuals and that has to be taught and engaged right from the get go. Yeah. And, and there's not a, a huge amount of people who are into Fit. that. I was going to say you're narrowing your scope. Yeah. So your your lasso of how you're going to reel people in, you're shortening that lasso of how you're going to reel people in. Yeah, but that being said, that's not bad either. It's like if there's a big enough population, you can get all of them to come to your facility and you're only working with the ones that you you want to work with, it becomes a 10 for you instead of being a six and a half because you have to have schmucks in there because you got to pay the bills. Exactly. Yeah, it's 100% true. So it's like, well, would you rather serve uh, 50 people who are your ideal clients or would you rather serve 500 people where maybe 100 of them are your ideal clients, but you now have to serve 400 people who don't fall into that. Um, yeah. And once again, it's neither good nor bad. It's just what are you looking – what gives you fulfillment? How does that resonate with you? And um, yeah. Yeah. Is it heavy or is it is it you know more lightning? More, yeah. More uh, – But I, I think most gym owners don't have that that mindset. I think most gym owners will – first off, when you open a gym, you have the financial um, burden of having to pay the bills, right? So once you open those doors, you have to have a certain amount of clientele come through the door. So your ability to um, niche down or pare down your who you want to serve is is somewhat limited – but if you're ultimately able to, let's say you could open a gym and you didn't have to worry about any of that shit, then you could build a process in the beginning and maybe have an interview process of like, okay, based on this set of questions and, and this, just the way when we're talking, how we vibe with one another, man, you're a good fit or, hey, you know, maybe you're not quite ready for this. Yeah, and I, I definitely think there's a lot of uh, different variables in that equation. I was actually uh, – I met somebody last week who is in former military, and I sat down with him just serendipitously. We had some mutual friends, and we had a cup of coffee together, and uh, he invited me over to his facility where it's like a 17,000 square foot, probably like, I don't know, $5 million facility um, a little bit further south of me um, where they do personal training and that kind of stuff. And uh, he's uh, obviously former military, so they, they, he, he's looking to be that uh, cornerstone in the veteran community of, of getting people healthy and, and those even who are still within active duty um, who are in reserve that need to stay fit because there's a large percentage of people who are Army reservists or military reservists who wouldn't pass physical fitness tests in order for them to actually um, like make it into the field. They would get discharged. Uh, so we had a conversation about that. We trained today and I saw this facility and, um, you know, one of the things that kind of gets hung up is the, is, is little things like equipment or, um, you know, branding and, 
what you know the place is kind of built for versus mm. what you need it for. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and, and this is a fantastic. It's a beautiful facility. Every little thing you need. Um, but you know, it, it, you have to have a clear vision of who you're trying to cater to. If not, it's just going to be a big LA fitness that looks fancy and has, you know, fancy lights versus somewhere like Cresty performance where they have everything they need, nothing they don't. And every single person in there is, is, is vibrating at that f- same frequency. And it's a mm. reason why, you know, some of the best athletes in the world, uh, will either go to them one in Massachusetts or down here in Jupiter. Yeah, that makes, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, when you build in that that frequency and that energy behind it and the messaging behind it and your your purpose behind it and your goal behind it and you put it out there and people either resonate it with the don't and it draws people into it. Um yeah, that's a good point. Now is he um has he found success in, in opening this facility? Is he struggling? Is he well? Uh, he had some partners. He's kind of like the execution guy, who's kind of um, they have basically what you do is I, I think they were catering to personal trainers, bringing in their own clients, and then you could pay a, a, a fee to use the facility, um, or you can hire the personal trainers that are there mm-hmm. if you wanted to just come in. Uh, but like just thinking about what the you know, the overhead of this place is and how you're actually going to make money on a facility. Um, and, and, and in terms of marketing as well, I mean, it's just, that's a, it's, that's a, it's a bear. Yeah. Yeah. They built themselves. A, a, and that's, that's the thing, right? It's like you have this idea in your head of what you want it to be. Yeah. And you're so excited about it. And, but then you also, do you think it's a problem of, of following what what's out there and like, Oh, that's this is how it's been done. So this is how I need to do it. I mean, that definitely could be a factor. Um, you'd have to kind of pick the brain of the person who, who, who created it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I think sometimes we get caught in the, like this looks great or this is cool versus mm. what's actually practical and what you really want to do. And sometimes you have to go through the process of trying to, you know, build the facility or, or build the business that you want to get to a point you go, Oh shit, I don't want to do this. Wow. You know what I mean? Like how many people go to medical school or go to, you know, go to uh, graduate school or go to college and do in doing that, they go, Oh shit, this is not what I want to do. Thank you for the $35,000 lesson. Yeah. That was, uh, my MBA. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you anything that I've, uh, can even remember uh, or anything that I've used from it. <laughs> Though I met Dominique in well, the program. So that right there could be all worth it. Yep. Or that could be a stone dragging to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> depends. <laughs> depends on who you, depends on how you frame it. How you frame it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. That's, you know, obviously Dominique is a huge influence on your life and probably makes you a much better person. But, um, you know, who's to say it's not, right? Like, that's one of the fucked up things about life in general. It's like, oh, this thing's the greatest thing in the world to me. It's like, is it? <laughs> like, you don't fucking know. And nobody knows. Like, there's only guideposts. But, like, at the end of the day, you've got to make a decision of whether or not you want to make it work. I wish it was that. I wish it was easier. Like, that's mm. a part of me. Like, I wish it was easier to just be like, that's the right decision. That's not the right decision. This person tells me what to do. They tell me not what to do. And it's so much easier to live that way. And you can obviously see why I have this attraction to gurus and to people who can just tell me how it is. Because if I just Mm. have them tell me what to do, then life becomes a lot more one-dimensional. But then you start to realize after a certain amount of time that they don't have the answers either. And then you're left in the same place that you were saying, wait a second, I'm not fulfilled. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm coming to the point now where I'm starting to understand those uh, reoccurring um, stories that I follow and just being okay in that uncomfortability of not knowing. And I think that's a huge step forward for myself personally. Yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of like fulfillment, I think what it comes down to is going inside and the more you can get connected with how energy or, or how it resonates with you and your body, the, the more that you're going to be able to become aware of when that happens. 
Yeah, definitely. Checking in with yourself is, is, is hugely important, uh, but ha- also having um, mentors and people who influence your, you know, your awareness is, is important. Having those people to go to who aren't going to give you unsolicited advice, mm. uh, but who are going to give you uh, perspectives. And I yeah. think those are the most important people in your life, right? Yeah, the people who are able to shine the light on something and, oh shit, I didn't see it that way. Because you could try to do this work or going inward by yourself. That's why I think you know, everyone needs a coach or somebody to talk to who has a different perspective on things. Because once again, we're always looking through our gunked up windshield and uh, just just seeing things a little bit cloudy. Like you could be, like you were saying, you could be the guru of all gurus, but you still have that fucked up programming from somewhere somewhere down underneath that that just kind of is a little making things a little bit fuzzy. And then somebody else just can just. Oh, did you look at it this way? And just that little thing there, and it doesn't have to be big, but just like just that little bit of nudge, then totally reframe something for you. You're like, oh shit! Like, how did I not see that there? It's like when you're looking for your keys, and the whole fucking time was just in your pocket. <laughs> or like, where the fuck's my cell phone? And you're holding yeah. it in your hand. And it's not even that that person <laughs> told you where it was. It just gave you the like space to be like. You, you have the answer. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. I, had, I do have the answer. Um, mm-hmm. And serendipitously, I'm started, I just started reading Mentors by Russell Brand. And, and that's one of the things that he talks about is, uh, is how he, one of his friends that he sees as a mentor. He has many mentors in his life in various areas. But whether it's from uh, his, his uh, sponsor or um, you know, mentors of his career or his relationships or uh, that kind of stuff uh, about how they – you know, he uses the analogy of just basically being punched in the chest with the force of awareness and just, um, being shown the things that you are not seeing, or Mm. maybe you do see, but don't want to accept in a certain way. Hmm. You know what I mean? Does he give an example of that in the book or anything? No, I mean, just what, what do you think that means? Say it one more time. See, I, I punched in the chest of awareness and with awareness, with awareness. And then, so punch in the chest of awareness in the sense that like, like you, you it, it with the force um, of something that can profoundly shift you. So mm-hmm. if I say to you, um, you know, you've been drinking every night, mm. boom, you just got hit in the chest with awareness. Yeah. Okay. Got you know it. What I'm saying? Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not actually physically changed, but. Um, you know, someone pointing something out to you. Um, and again, uh, I think the most important part, especially for me, is that as a person who wants to affect people and to create change, is that I want to instigate the connection with people. I want to tell them what's wrong. And I don't allow them to find out what's wrong. Right. You know, I'm yep. not the person who shines the light. I'm the person who tells you what to do mm. or tells you what I think you should do. Right. And, and, that, and then that person isn't ready to receive. And then there is a bit of frustration. This has happened multiple times in my life, probably with you and I even, um, of how I think I know how to do it. And it backfires in my face. And that person is now saying like, no, nope, you're not in my, you're, you know, I'm not allowing you in my space at this point because I can't trust you. Mm. It's almost when you get a math tutor who's like, oh, you, you know, just do this equation and they just do it for you. And it's like, oh, great. Now I know 8 times 8 is 64 because I memorized 8 times 8 is 64 because you wrote that memory down. So now I memorized that. But did I understand the process of how you got to 8 times 8 is 64? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there is, uh, like what you're saying, um, when somebody is there and they're trying to force feed, sometimes for me, I want to, like, I don't know for you, but like, I do want somebody to say to me, like, do it this way. And I'm like, okay, cool. And if I trust you and I do it this way, then I'll see the results. So I think there's, like, not not that there's opportunity, but I think there's moments there when that is, um, when that there is truth, but I think there's, mm, not truth. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this that way. You want to feel free to help me out here? What What do you feel like you want to say? Um, or in, in, even in trying to figure it out, like, we, uh, you know, what I offer is just take a second to just feel what you're feeling. Mm. 
and then just start coming from that place. Mm. And let's see what let's see where that goes. Yeah. So what you were saying before and wanting to lay lay it out and put it in a certain way, you know, there's certain moments, for instance, like with my workouts where I do want somebody to lay out everything for me and then, okay, then I can go through, boom, hit those check marks, fill out those boxes. Great. Um, but then there's also moments like, let's say someone's teaching me how to do a lift and they're trying to force my feet or force my positions into a certain way. And it just doesn't feel right. And they're trying to keep on getting me to be in that position. Uh, and I don't think they're quite connecting with me because they're not aware of how it's feeling in my body, but they just know what works for them. And they're trying to almost force that on that person. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that, that articulated very well and I completely understand where you're coming from there. Um, and again, I think when we, when we do this, it kind of comes from a place of connection and not trying to figure it out. Mm. Right. Because it's a profoundly different feel and frequency when we try to figure something out versus something that comes from the heart comes from, from genuine, um, curiosity, uh, and not from regurgitation of what someone else said. And I'm a very, very, very good person at just hearing a lot of things and then just saying them. Like I would, I would be great at like copying somebody else's comedy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like at the end of the day, that's not my jokes. That's, those aren't my words. Like, um, I'm doing a very good job of impersonating them, but when people are not in a position where they are willing to be duped, they're mm -hmm. not going to want to listen. So the people who are willing to be duped or who are willing to uh, just be a follower are yeah. always going to listen to the person who wants the people to follow them, right? Versus yeah. those who are a little more strong-willed um, are like, no, nah, I smell your bullshit. And yeah. that's me. Yeah. I, well, I think for me, like a part of it is this wanting to, to feel smart and feel praised for being smart mm -hmm. where I could take somebody else's idea and I can say that to somebody and then they come back with like, Oh, that's really smart of you or whatever. And then you're like, Ooh, that feels good. So I think the, the ego plays into that for me at least of like the, the kind of re like um, regurgitation. But then there's also a part of me that I know when I tell people about a certain thing that I've learned it helps me to reinforce what I learned and then I, I begin to embody it more and it becomes like rather than a place of regurgitation, it actually becomes into my subconscious. So I imagine for you, it's very similar. Like there are, there, I mean, everything in this world, right, is it's, there's nothing that's truly original. You're just taking pieces of what has already been done and you're, and you're reframing and repositioning it into something that is your own and it's shaded with your own life experiences there's that part, but I also understand that there's also the part of hearing someone say something and then saying it the same exact way as a, and passing it off as your own idea. And then that, I imagine that is something for me and for you that resonates in a completely different frequency. But there's also for, like for me, like I love taking something that was said on a podcast or an idea like, wow, this idea really resonated with me and then saying it to somebody or passing it along, like, isn't that interesting and see how they take it and seeing how it impacts them and how they view it. And then just the fact of telling somebody, it reminds me and it becomes more embedded into my subconscious. So at this point I am now like, I might even think that was something I truly uniquely thought of, mm. but it was probably just somebody's something I heard or took in and then said it so many times that now it's just, in my subconscious in a way. So do you, you know, does that create growth expansion or does that create more of a reliance upon external? Hmm. I, I, for, for me, if it's a, if like, let me just give it like, let me give an example of where I feel it is growth and expansion. Um, I just listen on podcast of the idea of where you're feeling something in your body will dictate what that means. So if you feel something in your body and your stomach, that's fear. If you feel something in your body and your chest, that's sadness. If you feel something in your head, that's like aggravation. And I thought that was a really, really cool concept. 
And I'll tell people about that and I'll see how that resonates with them. And if they found truth in that, if they feel similar things. And then I also notice within myself, like now I'm bringing awareness to it. So I'm, I'm taking this idea and I'm spreading it. And so the idea of spreading a, a valuable piece of information, like that person, if it's, if they're, that they won't get offended that I said their idea and I'm spreading their idea, that's what they want. So um, what's his name? Seth Godin has this idea. It's like, I don't want you to learn from me. I want you to learn from the people who I've taught because then I know that there's this idea of this idea is spreading and it's becoming and it's, you know, it's multiplying and it's, and it's becoming its own thing. So that for me is very growth and expansive where I feel contraction is, you know, making my ego, pumping my ego up by telling, let's say I take that same story of like, you know, you know, the, you know, if you feel this in your chest, you feel this in your stomach, feel that in your head. And it's a way for me to, you know, to pump up my ego and make myself feel smart because that was, you know, this is idea and the research that for me is contracting. So I, I think it depends on where it's coming from. Yeah. I, I see where you're coming from on that. Um, I know one thing that I get caught up a lot on is getting these cool ideas um, believing they're the gospel and then spreading them to everybody. You know what I mean? And, and again, some people will pick it up right away and they'll chew it and they'll love it. But I think those who are more, I guess, I, guess, I go back to the, the, the phrase like strong-willed or um, have their own path, are not going to resonate nearly as much with it because they, um, you know, there's that level of authenticity that they're waiting to see in people. So like for, for instance, in this occasion, if you were to practice that on your own for a year straight and be like, damn, this fucking is truth. Like I, like I've gone and done it for a year and felt these mm. things and whatever that is going to have a profoundly different impact than if you just, I've heard this on a podcast and then you're just playing telephone. And I think mm -hmm. that's sometimes what happens is that I'm again, well, I'll just give myself for an example for me it is much more egoic based it turns out where it's like, I just want people to hear the right thing because I need to hear the right thing. And if, if they believe it, then that means that what I'm saying is worth believing. Mm. So it's, it's almost so like, you're almost like testing it out. Yeah. It's like affirmation. Yeah. Whereas like, imagine that you talked about intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. right? Something you heard and then you're like, yeah. Oh wow, that's interesting. And maybe told some people about it, but then you did it. Yeah. for a long time. Yeah. That's going to have a profoundly different impact in the way that you convey that message uh relative to other people and you're not going to have that attachment to if you don't believe this then I'm not going to believe this or it's going to mean it's less than what I thought it was. Whereas if you're giving this information or giving these stories or giving this uh opinion mm. without the attachment to it then it doesn't matter if that person takes it or leaves it. Uh, it, it. It doesn't affect you. Right. I think there are also times when I know, well, reading the person and I know the relationship with the person, I won't even say a certain thing because I know it's not going to resonate with them. Yeah. So they're, they're just the, even the idea that the, that the ego is, or excuse me, the voice in your head isn't you. Mm -hmm. That idea, I won't even say to people because they'd be like, because they're just not, I know they're not in a position to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people just aren't there yet. And I was actually listening to the podcast last week about how you were saying like, how, how would it be if there was an eight or 10 year old version of Sean where you said, yo, you're not the voice in your head. Would I have at that point knew what you were talking about? Right. Mm -hmm. And if you really were in a knowing you may not have even be able needed to say that. It's more of yeah. like the energy behind it. It's almost like, um, you know, Darren Brown, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hypnotist and uh, or he's a mentalist, and he's also written some books and done a bunch of uh, you know stand up and all sorts of Netflix shows and stuff like that. So he, he basically it's the power of influence, right? And when mm -hmm. you believe enough and you talk to somebody, they don't even need to hear what you're saying. It's like that energy behind it. They're just like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. So it's like, you know, he'll literally cold call people or, you know, go right up to people and be like, you look very tired. You should go to sleep. And then they'll just sit down and they'll go to sleep. It's mm -hmm. not a huge, it's like, you know, a 30% thing he says, but I can completely understand where that comes from. Because if you have a profound deep knowing within yourself and you believe it and mm -hmm. you say it, 
there are certain people who are out there who are waiting for you to if it's waiting to hear it from you. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting, like the whole idea of energy. That's a big. So the the guys I've been listening to on this podcast for the past couple of weeks, that's something that they continually hit upon is this idea of energy and frequency, and bringing more attention to that. Because even like we were saying last week, it was like Theo Vaughn. It's not even the things that he's saying that are funny. It's the energy that he puts behind it and his own originality puts behind it. Um, So, and I mean, mean, even saying the word coming, he doesn't say coming, he says cooming. (laughs) Cooming. It doesn't mean anything. If I said it, I was like, yo, Tyler, I'm cooming. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just the the energy. Uh, that, well, I think it goes back to this whole idea is that we didn't have language through our evolution, right? So how did we connect and interact with one another? And it was was the energy that we put out? Mm-hmm. And that's something I've been thinking about. Just being in you know New York City is you're surrounded by so many people. You have so much energy surrounding you. How do you navigate through that? <laughs> Yeah, but I think uh, everybody's looking for like this solid frequency and energy, mm. one in which that they're accepted, one in which they feel home. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I, I, I create bias with myself, but I think that's kind of what my soul really wants is this overall feeling of acceptance. And when we're around those people, we gravitate toward them. We want to be near them more. Or sometimes, obviously, there's the opposite effect where they're so accepting of us. We're like, you're fucking weird. I don't want to be near you. I think it's more, <laughs> I think it's more the, the, the prior than the latter. You yeah. know, I really like those people who are just so like, they, you, know, you know who they are. And, yeah. and it's just like everybody loves them and everybody really appreciates them. Mm. But that's who they are. It's not who they're trying to be. Right. You know, and, 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 and in doing this podcast with you, you know, if we're sitting here trying to do a good podcast and trying to sound a certain way, what it's removing is our own authenticity from this podcast. If mm-hmm. we're just regurgitating shit we hear from other podcasts or shit we read in books and not bringing in our own flavor, energy, and experience, it's fucking meaningless. Like, right. you know, you telling me about, you know, some of your frustrations about, um, you know, being judged for not being able to do things quick enough and all that kind of stuff, that is far more profound than the articles you tell about me. And I imagine the things that I say that I regurgitate from other people probably aren't nearly as profound as me telling me, telling you I'm fucking frustrated right now. I haven't mm. slept in days and I'm still here and I'm still showing up and I'm still trying to be the best version of myself, you know? Yeah. 100%. Just the, yeah, it's the energy that you put behind it. As I'm listening, I just already feel it, it just, it draws you in and I think you're absolutely right. It's because it's coming from a completely different place. Like there's a place inside of you that's, that is linked to energetically to your own true life experiences. And then as you come up with them and as you open up with them, that just puts something out there that draws it in having this conversation draws me in and like, has me like, just, just come, you know, completely, um, not paralyzed, but just like, just locked in. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and I, and I do feel that I'm like locked in and listening when you're telling me about something because I might glean something out of it, but there, it's two different frequencies that are going on there. There's like one frequency, like, Oh, like he's giving me a piece of information and gleaning and like, Oh, that's cool. But then there's also like, Oh, he's coming from like a raw vulnerable place. Let me lock in and really connect and be there for him. Yeah. Or be there or be there with him. Yes. Yes. And I think it speaks to that person, that, that partner ourselves that wants to be seen and recognized as well. And when that shows up in your life in front of you, that part of you goes, Oh cool. Now I can show up like that. Hmm. It's it's that 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 gives giving permission uh, uh, for people to be open and vulnerable, and it's, it's got to start somewhere. So it's it's I think uh, when we listen to podcasts, when we read books, when we watch television shows of people who are open and vulnerable, and we constantly go back to them over and over and over again. Um, for me personally, I try to then emulate that, but mm. I'm I'm emulating the way someone else is open and vulnerable instead of finding and cultivating my own way of being open and vulnerable. And I'll tell you right now, like if I were to do things my way, like I would be a uh, like, uh, you know, if, if I were to say like what kind of comedian I would be, 
Um, I think most of, most likely I would be a grouchy, frustrated, angry comedian like a Sam Kinison who just yells at everything. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Who's just constantly frustrated with the world. But, um, you know, is that my highest version of myself? No. But I think it, in terms of like that realm, I definitely think that that would be in, at some time, maybe that's who I am. And I think that's also something that happens in comedy in general is that there's really funny people who are early on in their careers who are like, wow, you have all of the elements to being funny, but you haven't got it yet. Mm. And, and it's interesting because I saw Theo Vaughn's original pod or his uh, Netflix special. And I said, this is terrible. so bad. It was terrible. so bad. And you listen to him now and you're like, these are two different people. Right. And he had to go through the shit that he needed to go through in order for him to become Theo Vaughn. And that's yeah. the same thing with fucking Elon Musk, Oprah, Bill Gates. Yeah. Everybody has to has to have their, their walk through the fire, so to speak. And yeah. we're all at different paths and we're all, you know, my, my girlfriend tells me about this all the time and I'm, I'm more and more, uh, you know, more and more uh, accepting of it. it, open to it, is that like, A, no one has the answer, but B, everybody is where they are and if you accept where you are, you're going to have a good life. Mm. You know, being unsatisfied completely overall about not – about where you are is just never going to give you a recipe for success in life. Right. You know, and that's, I I feel where my imbalance is, is that I have a far more, I think I need to fix than I do. I can appreciate, so to speak. Hmm. Yeah. What I was thinking about when you're making that Theo Von Sam is like where we were in the beginning of this podcast, where people don't think that they're capable of change. Like right there, like, how scared would you be to, to do what he did and bomb a special and then be able to then completely just stay like just stay with it and then like transform and now have like this super successful podcast and he's at the, the top of his career? I, I feel for, like for myself, like I would maybe be tied to that story of like, oh, my God, I had this special and I fucking completely fucked it up. And uh, and like and then almost um not judging myself, but uh, being uh, convinced that I'm not funny because because of that. Yeah. Um, it, it it really comes down to this. Like when you stop giving a fuck, and I know this sounds still cliche, mm. when you just stop giving a fuck, that's when you start showing up mm. in your authentic in your authentic self, and you just you know, and you see those guys, um, and it takes an evolution. Uh, we use uh, comedy as this example, but. It, it takes a while for you to stop caring what everybody else thinks and just be you. And yeah. there are probably dozens of comedians who will never make it mainstream. But yeah. you might see them on any given night and they might, amongst their peers, be quoted as like, they're the best comedian they've ever seen. But they just don't check the boxes for the mainstream. Yeah. Whereas there are some comedians who resonate at that frequency, who find that that's their funniest selves. And it, it just – for, it, it just resonates with much more people. There's the comedian's comedian, and then there's the everybody's comedian, and you can't mm. be both. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of like we're getting into this idea of authentic self, being in alignment, and then what I've been working on is trying to use my body as a tool to to keep that in mind and to use that as a tool to bring me back into that. So if I get triggered by something, using my body and my breath to bring me back into it and then, okay, like why did that trigger me? But let me see how this is feeling in my body. And I just – like I'm just starting to kind of tap into it a little bit. But just even feeling that there's this toolkit inside of me, it makes me feel open and uh, it makes me feel like there's something there, like where I'm not lost, where I always have something right there at any moment where I can tap in and be like, okay, what the fuck's going on? Why is this affecting me in this way? And as I continue to do that and then bring myself back into alignment, then everything will just kind of take care of itself in a way. Yeah, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, this afternoon, I was doing a post on Instagram about something, and I was, uh, you know, also coaching a class. And somebody, you know, yelled out like, uh, "Get off your phone!" And that fucking made me livid, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, being called out and being exposed and being vulnerable like that, 
is not what I want to do, especially when I'm supposed to be leading the class. So, mm-hmm. you know, the role that I'm in, the role that I've accepted as the leader and then having a subordinate, like give you the business fucking triggered me. And mm-hmm. it made me feel inside this, this, um, unease, right. I don't necessarily, again, I, I tried to my, as best as possible, kind of follow suit with some of the strategies that others have, have put forth, um, because I've seen success with it before, but obviously adding my own flavor to it, but, um, just fucking wanted to flip out and just be angry. And yeah. then, you know, you allow it to be there. You observe it. It's not you, you're in the moment. But, uh, then afterward following through with, with the more authentic self in the sense of who I want to be and apologize. Like, yeah, hey, you're right. I shouldn't have been on my phone. My bad. And not to appease them, but to be like, yep, this is what you got to do, man. Show up. I, mm. I know you don't want to do this right now. I know you want to crawl into a hole and die, but yeah. you got to show up and you got to be a fucking good person because that's what being a good person is in yeah. my mind. I don't know. Fuck yeah. Do I know? I, no, I, I think there's like, you know, something like I've said before is like be the lighthouse and then mm. how are you supposed to act? Mm. And then when you're not acting that way, you feel like a hypocrite and you feel like you're this piece of shit and that you're fucking up. And like, how am I supposed to influence change when I came and fucking do this myself? Like, yeah. this is like, I'm just like being like a con artist. This is bullshit. And I think the thing is, it's like, we're all going to fuck up, but it's, but it's like, and like, and if somebody were else were to be in the same situation that you're in, wouldn't you have empathy? Like I would say, and you have to take it like the percentage of like the time, what type of person are they? And then, okay, is this an aberration or was this truly who they are? And I think when we have that moment where we get, cause I think of this all the time um, as I'm coaching and let's say I'm at another gym that I'll, uh, so I, I, let's say this is true life. Like I coach at this gym, uh, in the, in Soho where all these, uh, trainers train at and half of them are on their phone while they're with their clients They're or actually I would say all of them are on their phones. I haven't seen one trainer be in a session with his client the entire time and not be on Instagram, Oof. which is to say that most of these guys, they're, they're there because it's a job. It's not what they want to do. Yeah. And that's okay. But for me, it's like seeing that it's like, Oh my God. In that same essence, there are moments where it's like, oh, fuck, like I forgot to post this. Okay, he's running to grab a drink of water. Let me flip over my phone and I'll post this because I forgot to post it. And I'm like, fuck. And like, and like as I'm doing it, I'm like, dude, you were just fucking judging all these people mm. for being on their phones while with their client. And now you're going on your phone and it's just like, fuck. And like you like beat yourself up about it. And then you're like, okay. Dude, just get the fuck off your phone. And if you f- and if for me, if I feel like I'm consistently do that, I just need to fuck not have the phone near me. If I want to, if I truly am, if I'm gonna be that person and be that um, person for their clients. Now, if you ask all of my clients, would they say what type of uh, coach is Tyler? They would say, dude, he's never on his fucking phone. He's always completely locked in with me. Um, but even saying that that I know that there have been moments where my mind has drifted and I've wanted to either check something on my phone, check an email, um, what's going on with another client. Are they going to be there later on today? Let me text them quick. So, you know, it's like, there's that ebb and flow with the phone. Um, and that's just kind of what came up for me, but just like this inner judge, inner critic, um, but like, as soon as we start even like judging those other trainers and everything like that, it's like, is that helpful? Because once again, like now I'm creating this story of, you know, they're different from me. I'm different from them, me against them. Where is that expansive or contractive? You know? Yeah. Who knows? And in that moment you might think that's expansive and then you have a new layer of awareness and then all of a sudden you go, Oh shit, really wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And Mm -hmm. not feeling guilty for that because you had to go through that in order for you to get this lesson. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the moment you understand that you feel that guilt, you can let it go and then actually follow through with the lesson. Because I think for me personally, feeling the guilt and then beating myself up over it prevents me from actually (laughs) receiving the lesson. Exactly. And living the truth. 
Yeah. You know, it's another because way now, of sabotaging. Now, yeah, now it goes from the from about being about the lesson itself and more about self-hatred and self and self-criticism. Yeah, exactly. And then how can you ever be in a position of change when you're just beating yourself up? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it, it, it's another ploy of the ego and, and you don't know until you have the awareness uh, to, to, to know differently by talking to other people and seeing what makes them successful. And I think what happens also is because we are in a day uh, and um, yeah, this, this is, I think a really, really good point is we live in an age where we see so many successful people and that's all we see of them. Right. We don't see the vulnerability. We don't see them fucking up. We don't see them going through the same things that we are. But I'll tell you what, as a coach, an entrepreneur, a person in a relationship, a brother, um, all those other things, when I see other people who are that same way and who are still successful, that is one of the most attractive things to me. Mm. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that much because of the... um, the images and Mm -hmm. the way that just the world works. Now we get, we have access to everything, but we, we don't realize that we don't get everything. We don't, we don't really have access to everything about everyone. We have access to everything that we want others to see. Exactly. Yeah. For now. Mm Mm-hmm. But I think that'll, that'll begin to change in another, like Rogan keeps saying that. Just like our thoughts and everything is just going to be transcribed. Yeah. Just... I mean, I think that'll be down the road. And I think, I mean, everything's like, oh, this, that. I, it, it's never going to look the way we think it's going to look. Right. Never. Right. You know, it's never right. going to look the way we think it's going to look. It's going to be, you know, we have an idea of what, what the function of it might be. But in terms of the practicality and the way that it actually, the X's and O's line up, it's never, it's, it, it usually doesn't happen the same way because it's just built upon the limited scope of what we know so far. Right. Right? Yeah. Like the Jetsons thought that like we'd have hover cars now. Yeah. Right? The fuck happened to hover cars? Or hoverboard? I mean, we, I guess we have a hoverboard, but even then it's kind of... Come yeah. on. Well, I think, uh, what's his name? Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about like uh, flying cars. The problem is, is like right now, the, the thing with a flying car is that like you need an enormous amount of like air to be pushed out, which creates noise and all sorts of other shit. So it's like, it's not practical. Right. So now, yeah, until new, some new, type of tech, yeah, new technology yeah. of like electromagnets or some shit like that could come out, but it's not going to be like that, right? You know, yeah. right? you know what I mean. Like, obviously, there's some things that hit the, the nail on the head in terms of like cell phones and stuff like that, but I mean, maybe it's it's just based upon what we know so far, and in the next hundred years, like that will be like, oh wow, remember when we had cell phones? Like now we just have this microchip in the side of our head, and then we could do everything from there, you know? Right? Yeah. Um. A little bit of a tangent, but just like the idea of – just like the iPhone. I was, I was watching the uh, documentary on Netflix called like the, the 2000s and it's talking about the iPhone and the iPhone coming out. And just like the iPhone, just when it came out, it was like, how is this possible right now? This is really <laughs> weird. It's like this shouldn't be – I shouldn't be able to access this already. This is like 10, 15 years down the road and I'm already getting it in 2006, 2005 yeah. where it should be something that should have been invented now. You know, it's like the Terminator Two coming out. Yeah, exactly. How that the fuck came did Terminator Two come out in ninety two? Ninety two, and it's 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 special effects are better than fucking. Oh my god! Still, still to this day, like the T one thousand, dude. Like, well, I it think, holds up. It definitely holds up. I'll tell you one of the reasons why, and they got away from this is, uh, you know, they they started reverting to CGI, CGI yeah. instead of the small sets. They basically yeah. made like tiny sets and then just filmed that. Right or, or robotics or whatever it might be, which obviously they found was much more expensive. But right. it's like at the time, that's all they had. So like I think Jaws holds up. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that or was even forty years old. Yeah. Or uh, Jurassic Park even holds up. Absolutely. Because they use because they use animatronic dinosaurs. That's right. So yeah. it's like yeah, maybe we should go back to. Well, I think where you find the sweet spot is. You do a mixture of the two. You do animatronics. Because even like right now, Game of Thrones, those fucking dragons look fake as fuck. Okay, don't spoil alert me, okay? Have there been dragons in Game of Thrones? I'm just saying. I'm just putting it out there right now. All right. We're not – this is – this. Is, you don't have to warn me about spoiler alerting. I know you didn't watch last week's episode. Well, I'm just we reminding about- you. Okay, I'm just reminding you. All right. Okay. Okay. 
Yes, you're absolutely right. The dragons look fake as fuck. She's riding a fucking saddle with a tennis ball in front. <laughs> so true. But you know what? Like, that is what it is. It's you know good. I mean? It's it's good enough, and it's yeah. But, it's it's not what we what what like people make it out to be. Right. It's just like people just acknowledge it. And be like, oh yeah, it's shitty. All right, it's a good show. You know I mean? yeah, it, right it's like it's it's good enough for yeah. it to for it to be on a show but um there's some fucking stuff that's coming out in the ne- like oh it's it's something like this e-machine or something like that where they have a scene it's it, there are little clips of this coming out it's just like a, the ability for the computers to run fast enough the hard drives to be big enough the chips to be fast enough and then the uh actual um like fiber optics and speed of internet to be able to do this, but they are now making sceneries that are completely computer generated. Like they did a commercial and it's like, Oh wow, that's a, you know, what kind of car is that? Like, where is that filmed? And then they reveal, it's like, this is all computer generated. And you're like, there's no way this is computer generated. That's how advanced they're getting where you can't tell that it wasn't, that's not real. Right. So it's coming. It's just it's it's got to be scaled. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like maybe like right now we could go. Like I think the new Avatar that they're going to come out with. Yeah. Like that's going to be all CGI, and we're gonna have no idea. And yes. I think it's going to fucking destroy everyone's minds, like the first movie. But like that's why that's why like I think you're right. I think it's coming down because. But that once again, you have to go to a movie theater. You have to put on those glasses and everything like that. And I just don't think we like it'll be like fifteen, twenty years down the line till we get that type of access. Because even if you watch like the original Avatar at home, it's not it's going to be as good as that if you're in a theater. So the, like taking that Avatar experience in a theater and bringing that to everyone at home, it's just going to take like another ten, fifteen years where it's cheap enough to do. Where yeah. the technology is there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, we've gone a lot of places here today, Tyler. You got anything else? Mm, that about wraps it up. That's a good way, good way to end it. Avatar two, look out! <laughs> it's underwater. Oh, jeez, that's one of the most challenging things to do because, uh, you know, the way that things move underwater is is profoundly different than what happens in in, in air, um, and just like the disturbances, they must have had to do, done some creative stuff and and done some amazing programming to actually get that. Like every time like a Pixar film comes out. Yeah. Like finding Nemo. Yep. They, they have talk to, about they have that. They invent technology to make something happen that they didn't have before. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, guys, if you like this podcast, you better subscribe. If not, <laughs> I'm email you a picture of my middle finger sticking up. I it's promise. national. It's national nudes day. Is so it really? I said yeah. nude this morning. That's so good. <laughs> Um, I've just picked up yeah. a random number on my phone and I just sent it. Anyway. Or if you want to uh, leave a comment or uh, on the show, maybe we'll read it out for you. Yeah, I would love to ask, answer some questions or something like that. What are you doing out there? Not leaving.